Hello, everyone. Your exits are here, here, and here. <laughs> Uh, welcome everybody to Noisy Thinking, um, second one this year. Um, so I uh, just wanted to take a quick word to thank our lovely, luscious sponsors, Flamingo, and also to thank Google for, again, their very kind hospitality for the venue and the drinks. And they've even uh, donated a speaker tonight. <laughs> she didn't get much better than that. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so, yes, welcome to Noisy Thinking. As you know, it's, it's about the brief tonight. Um, well, I just wanted to um, start off by <laughs> drawing attention to something I was reading in Ad Age uh, today. It said, welcome to the new first screen, your phone. A new mobile, uh, Millwood Brown study shows mobile use now outpacing TV. Well, I think, thank you, Millwood Brown, I think we knew that. Um, but, to be fair to them, we didn't really have any definitive, definitive um, evidence. And I did think this was quite interesting today because they said, according to the findings which were conducted across mobile users, <laughs> 12,000 of them worldwide, uh, the smartphone has emerged as the primary screen worldwide, which, you know, is pretty awesome, really. And they said, you know, it's still a recent phenomenon that people are tethered to their phones. Of course, we know about dual screening. Um, but their default is to type something into their smartphone. Of course it is, it's, all, 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 it's the behaviour that we, that we all have. And it just made me think, you know, the context of this question about the brief, it does beg the question, do we have the right briefing template? Should we have a template? Should we have the same questions? Should we ask them in the same way that perhaps people who were producing advertising 40 or 50 years ago were asking? I don't know, maybe we should. Um, but that's what, what tonight is about. It's about um, understanding the right vehicle for, uh, for asking the right questions, creating the right work, and ensuring we get the right delivery of it. And we, we, tend, to, we tend to rely on the brief, but is that right? Um, so, to answer that question, we've got four kings of the creative brief um, tonight. Um, in order in which they will speak, we are very privileged to have David Hackworthy, who I'm sure you all know, um, David is the CSO of Fallon at the moment, but he's done lots and lots of things. He's, he's led strategy in agencies across Australia, USA, and of course the UK for the last 20 years. And he says along the way he's worked for brands including Tesco, Coke, Mars, Qantas, Absolute. And most recently, David was the planning partner of Red Brick Road. He's now at Fallon. And he has, I know that you will know, he has some really innovative ideas about agency structure and working processes, and I'm sure he have something very provocative to say about the brief that he will share with us. Um, Craig Maudsley. Oh, is that spelt right now? Or not? Yeah, he did. I was just like, how did that happen? <laughs> um, so Craig needs no introduction. You know him as um, previously the APG chair and the Grand Prix of Grand Prix winners of the APG awards and one half of the... CSO Star Partnership at AMV. So um, I did think, what, what can I, I've known Craig for a long time, and I thought, what can I share with people? Where, what will I, where will I find out something about him? Um, so I went to the campaign A list and thought, hang on, I've got the question here. There's a question at the end, and it says, you might not know this, but. And so Craig's answer is, you might not know this, but I'm making it all up as I go along. So we'll see about that, won't we? We'll see about that later. Um, but welcome back to Craig for tonight's um, Noisy Thinking. And he also starts off the uh, AMV thread here, because as you know, Craig is at AMV. Uh, but Nate was also at AMV before he was at Google. So Nate, um, a degree in theatre, a stint at an internet startup, a DM agency, a stint, it says, at AMV. It's more than that, wasn't it? Uh, uh, as a digital planner and director of innovation, and of course, you, you now all know him as the head of creative agency partnerships at Google. Um, but he's also been a producer and digital integrator, and he knows a thing or two about briefs from all sorts of angles, so he's going to share his knowledge with us tonight. And last, but by no means least, Tiago, who you all know intimately now, you've read Campaign last week. <laughs> Um, he says, I think my job is doing stuff that gets other people to do stuff. 
and you know him as the ECD of Droga 5, of course. Now, Tiago started working at Interactive Media in Brazil in 1996. Since then, he worked for some of the world's best agencies and entertainment companies, and that includes the BBC and AMV. <laughs> David, you're on your own. You've never worked at AMV, have you? Oh, that's obviously next. Um, in 2009, Revolution magazine named him one of the 50 people that will shape the digital industry of tomorrow. God, the pressure. <laughs> no, it clearly did. That's why you're here tonight. Um, his work has received recognition. It's worth, it was worth um, recapping this. Can, One Show, DNAD, BAFTA, Creative Circle, Revolution, DMA, Campaign, Creative Review, Design Week, The Web is, you name it, he's won it. Um, but apparently he's unable to tie his shoelaces like a normal adult, but you can't have everything. Oh, well done, yeah. So um, the question tonight that they are all going to take on is, um, you know, fairly challenging one. What makes a good brief? Well, in fact, what makes a great brief? I know it was good brief, but I changed the brief just before you were about to come out. So what makes a great brief? Welcome to our speakers. Hopefully the chance will appear on there any minute. It's my, my um, reflection on being on this stage is that my mum has now worked out how to use Google Alerts. And so now when videos get posted, when the APG started posting these videos on YouTube, she'd sometimes get a Google Alert. And of course, uh, sometimes the, the things I speak about on this stage, as I will tonight, you, know, you get a bit passionate and you start swearing and that kind of thing. And my mum has never heard me say fuck before. <laughs> And then suddenly it's turning up and she's watching me and she's like, I liked your presentation about that thing. But oh. So, um, <laughs> sorry, mum. <laughs> if I swear later on, I probably will uh, later on in the presentation. But anyway, um, I'm here to talk about the brief. Uh, and I think the, the things you'll see on this one are a little bit more about the format of the brief than, um, than David's presentation, so slightly different take on things, and just thinking about whether or not what we have is really fit for purpose nowadays, and whether or not it's, it's really the thing that we need. So, first of all, I think, if you think about the brief, in many ways it is the very most important document in any agency, and for three primary reasons. So, first of all, we all want to get to great work, great creative work, however you define it, but the brief is going to be the start point for every single great campaign. Sometimes it's the impediment that the creatives have to get across in order to get to great work in the end. Sometimes it's a very direct inspiration for that work, but it is always the point where that process begins and as a result really important. Of course we all want to do effective work and ideally great work and effective work will go together. But a brief that addresses the right pr business problem is the one that ensures effectiveness. And we've all had that argument about whether or not, you know, creatively awarded work that didn't um, generate a result in market, is that valid? Should the industry be giving themselves those awards? And my answer to that is always, well, it's the planner's fault. Because all great creative awards are about is the potential to have a great effect if the brief was right in the first place. So getting the right brief, getting the right business problem is the answer to effectiveness and where you might go. And, and finally, and, and I think we don't talk about an awful lot, but it's the key to profitability. You know, if any of us are concerned with how much we're paid or how well we're doing in our career or whether or not our agency is about to lose a piece of business or whether or not they're about to lay people off, profitability is really important. And getting the brief right means less time in the creative department because that's the expensive time in an agency. Uh, to get somewhere really good. You know, and, and furthermore, I'd say, you know, if I were a management consultant, you know, if, I, if I were addressing our processes, if I were thinking about, right, how can the business of being a communications agency work better and be more lucrative, the brief is probably the place I'd look. Uh, our finance director drew me a graph that looks similar to this, um, which talked about how we make our money as an agency. And basically what happens is this bit above the line is the point where we're in profitability and the bit beneath the line is the point where we're losing money. Uh, and this bit is when the creative department get involved. Because <laughs> this bit, this is planners and account handling, this is all in the fee, this is hours, you know, and they're paying for these hours. They're paying us to hang out with them in meetings and stuff and knock the strategy back and forth and write the brief and that's all great. Then you get into the creative department. Now, of course, whilst the creatives are away thinking about the idea, they're not paying for those hours quite so directly. 
Uh, now this bit, this is when you get into production because they do often pay for that and that's all great, it's good or maybe it's the point where the ad's in market and you're starting to analyze the results because they pay us to do that as well. The distance between these two bits is all about whether or not your brief was any good. And by which I mean, is it the kind of thing where the client was absolutely set up for the work that you're going to present in first presentation? You know, did the creatives get somewhere really good to begin with, or did it take weeks or months and months to actually get to that answer? And the difference between the area underneath this bit of the graph and this bit of the graph and the area underneath this bit of the graph depends on whether or not your account's making money or not. And if it's not making money, then the work better be fucking amazing in order for them to stay your client because that's how we all get paid. So the brief is the thing that affects this distance and this depth, uh, depending on how senior it is as a creative team. It gets, if, you, if you're briefing the, the ECDs or something, it starts to go a bit like that. Nice, a nice junior placement team, more like that. But anyway, the distance is important each time. And so that's all about the brief. So the brief is a fundamentally important business document for our business, let alone uh, our clients' businesses. In fact, you could say it's kind of the primary tool for our success. So if you, this quote from Archimedes, if you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. And the brief is that lever. The brief is the ability we have as an agency to achieve amazing things to put our uh, highly paid, highly funded creative departments to the right use, to use that, that kind of weapon in its most effective way possible to change pretty much anything or everything. And the brief is the point. The brief is the point where things change. So how good is this tool that we've got? If we're saying the brief is primarily that tool that enables us to use our creative department well to get to great work, to get to work that affects business outcomes for clients, how good is the tool that we've got at the moment? So let's, let's look at it a bit. Let's analyze it a little. This is the bit where I've stolen some things from SlideShare uh, from Gareth Kay, who did a great presentation a few years ago, where one of the things that he did when he was talking about the brief was he was able to pick out briefs through history and brief formats through history. And it's kind of an instructive tour, really, on where the brief began, roughly, and then how the brief has changed over the years. So these are all credited to him and taken from his deck. So this is an old Chiat Day brief. Uh, you can see 1992 up here, so we're not going all the way, 1991 maybe, we're not going all the way back. Um, and it has the usual sections on it. You say, what is a good brief? How does it work? So we say, what's the problem or opportunity? Who are we talking to? What should the advertising achieve? They were allowed to say advertising in those days. How liberating, it's wonderful. Uh, what thought do we have to leave them with? What thought do we want to leave them with? Uh, what will we make them believe or what will make them believe or do this? What is required? Anything else, it says at the end. And then the normal bureaucracy at the top of who's involved and who gets kicked if things don't work well and uh, uh, how it works. So that's a shite day one. And DMB and B, a Mars brief. Uh, maybe something is similar to what you've seen there. So the simpler thing, why are we advertising? What do we want the advertising to do? How are the advertising achieve this? They keep saying advertising. They're just taunting us. Um, who are we talking to and what do we know about them that will help us? What's the essential message? What's the support? What's the brand character? Uh, GSD and M, I don't know. What's the advertising expected to accomplish? Who are we talking to? Who's going to the market? You know, you get the picture. Same kinds of things. It keeps going on. Roughly the same sorts of sections each time. FCB, we're up to 2001. Why are we advertising? Who are we talking to? How do they think and feel? What must the advertising say? What must it say? Uh, why should the consumer believe this? What's the tone? What are the executional considerations? 2001, the internet's starting to happen now. Uh, here we go, here's another one, no date on this one, Rexona for men. Background, why are we advertising? Who are we talking to? What's the one thing the advertising must say? Why should people believe it? The structure's kind of still there, it's working that way. Here's Lowe's, a little bit more modern, very much the same kind of structure. And then we move to PowerPoint. So then suddenly the brief is allowed to be on landscape, not portrait, which is the fundamental change here where planners were able to do boxes and move them around a bit and, and things have moved on a bit. We've got the business challenge, the communication test, the market insight, brand or product insight, consumer insight, engagement insight. Remarkable. Now we've got the, but still, what's the single thing that we want to communicate back to the old briefs in the 90s? What do we want to say? It's very much the same kind of thing. What's the support? What's the practicalities? It's on PowerPoint, it's got some nice colors on it, they've got a picture at the bottom, but it's fundamentally the same kind of structure. And in this time, 
Uh, the company that you know we're sitting in, who's sponsoring this, has been invented and created and suddenly exists, and, and they bought YouTube, and YouTube exists, and then Twitter appeared, and then Facebook, and everybody's suddenly able to watch anything that ever existed whenever they want to, and they're not stuck by schedules, and they're not stuck by TV, and nobody's reading newspapers anymore, and nobody listens to the radio, and sometimes they go past a poster, but they don't notice it because they're spending too much time on their mobile phones, and the brief is largely still the same. And so maybe you look at this and you say, well, you know, we're using old tools in a new world. And we've got that kind of you know, equivalent of the old Nokia in a smartphone world. And surely that can't work, can it? Surely that can't possibly work. You know, if we were in any other industry, this part of our process, this most important thing that we have, the thing that affects the work more than anything else, would have changed beyond recognition by this point, surely. So maybe we need new tools. Maybe what we need to do is to think about what those tools are. <coughs> or do we? And I remember spending a lot of time looking at that presentation that went through all those different brief formats. And, and if you look at where his presentation goes, as I say, find it on SlideShare, he makes a lot of really good constructive suggestions about how you know, we need to change the format, or we need different boxes, or they need to have different headings in, or something or other. But I, got to, I kind of stopped when I went through the briefing formats. And I got to thinking, well, are we looking at the right thing here? And I, and I thought back to AMV. Um, there's something of theme of the evening. Um, but I talk about this simply because I know it intimately, whereby we go, OK, so over the years, we've not really changed the brief substantially since we did you know, things like J.R. Hartley for Yellow Pages or the Twister ad for Volvo or Guinness Surfer, you know, that kind of world of broadcast TV moments. And that was kind of where the brief was. But then the same kind of format then was able to do, try something new today, which wasn't a tele ad. It was a thing that changed the whole behavior of Sainsbury's for quite a few years. And then it did things like Walker's Sandwich, where suddenly you're taking a broadcast TV vehicle and making it participative and social and releasing hundreds and hundreds of pieces of video content around. And it did things like Choose a Different Ending, where we were able to create the most awarded digital idea in the world from the same brief format at the same agency. We did things like Escape the Map, where we made the launch of the Mercedes C-Class into an online game. Uh, we were able to take the Snickers, you're not you when you're hungry idea and change the way that Google did search. And we did that, which was one of the most awarded digital ideas in that year. And then this last time, we took the Sainsbury's thing again. And then we did Christmas in a Day, which is a massive kind of crowdsourced uh, feature film project. And then even more confusingly, then we did this for Guinness, which was another tele ad. And the brief format remained the same throughout all of this period. And you start thinking, well, OK, so you go back, you analyze the briefing tools we used to get there. What were the things that happened? And I made this startling discovery, which is that the brief doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, you'd have to be a fucking idiot to receive that brief which says, what do we want to say in 2012 or 13 or whatever, and go, oh, pff, I mean, I do know about YouTube and social media, but this brief says I've got to do a broadcast solution. It says, what have we got to say? So I'm not going to think about those things. I'm just going to write a tele ad, because that's what the brief format implies. You'd have to be an imbecile in the creative department to do that. You know, you use the tools that are available to you. Uh, no, Tiago's left now, it's fine. Um, you know, and, and furthermore, you sort of think, well, you know, talking about the brief format, it's, it's a massive waste of time. The amount of time you spent, you know, you become head of planning somewhere, and the first thing you do is, you, oh, what are we going to do? I know, we'll change the brief format. We'll have a look at that. And occasionally, Bridget and I kind of talk about it and go, do we need to change the brief format? And then you just go, oh, God, really? And, and it's just boxes and words and, and that kind of thing, you know. Any time that we're spending analyzing the way we brief, you know, it's, it's, it's time taken away from all the useful, interesting things we could do about generating ideas and thinking, you know, go home. Don't, don't spend your evening here. There's two more speakers. It's going to be great after this. But I, I, maybe I thought I was going to be on last, I don't know, or first. Um, you know, talking to people, I mean, as David was saying before, talking to people is what this is all about. It is about a bunch of people in a room where some people know a little bit more about what the task is than the other people do, and they try and pass the information across to them, and then they have a conversation about it. And then at the end of that point, they kind of work out what they need to do. 
and the best briefs and briefings, as, as David was saying before, kind of reflect this, whereby the planner might have some stuff in there, but ultimately they're trying to test stuff out on creatives, and they're listening. And there's a piece of paper that comes out of it, but this, this thesis that somehow you know, the brief format is, is broken and is old-fashioned and is hampering our creativity and hampering the, the forms or formats with which we are able to execute. Certainly, if I look through that experience at AMV over the last 15, 20 odd years, the, the kind of empirical data about the work we have produced suggests that it's the wrong definition of the problem. You know, this is not the issue. And in fact, I don't see that much of a problem with it in too many ways. You know, as long as you've got that kind of quality of engagement there, it works. And finally, it's kind of, again, as, as I think David was mentioning, as long as you think about brief as a verb, not a noun, then you're probably in a pretty good place. As long as it's all about just thinking about doing that, back to that point about being real. Essentially, what we're trying to do here is make sure that everybody leaves the room knowing what the task is and knowing what needs to be done. And the biggest criticism that you can make about most of the briefs that go in is when you leave the room and then you pop up and you see the creative team after and you say, oh, what are you working on? And they're like, oh, I'm not really sure. Planner was up here for a bit and they left me with a paper and they talked to me about market share or something or other, but I don't know what that one's about. And fundamentally, it's just about the exchange of information and hopefully in as inspiring and interesting a way as it can be, but it's just a conversation. Nothing more, nothing less. It's the most important conversation you have and it's the conversation which will determine whether or not your agency does great work and does effective work and makes money, but it's just a conversation. And the brief format, the way it works, the piece of paper, the boxes on the paper, don't spend any more time thinking about it, <laughs> unless that's what Nate's going to talk about. Of course. <laughs> sure, up next. And that's me. Thank you, sir. Ah, uh, see, do I? Lovely. So, um, I always enjoy speaking at APG events. Uh, my background is I was a planner, sort of, uh, I've worked with a number of people in the room. It's great, it's exciting. I feel like having moved on from planning a little bit, I haven't written a brief or even really seen one in about a year and a half. So I feel a little bit like a fraud. Um, but it being Google, I thought, well, rather than looking at what just a good brief is, we should probably go beyond that to the future of the brief, well past what just is a good brief. So I'm gonna try and look at what, and then I thought, well, the truth is, uh, I can't really talk from the Google perspective. I can only talk from mine. So what I thought I would do is talk to you about what I think the good, a brief should be. If I was starting an agency now, how I would want to be briefed, how I want the brief to look, and what that might mean for me. And so um, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I want to start here. Cause, and if I should add, I think uh, most of these events, oftentimes I think events like this, <laughs> APG events excluded normally, I, I don't really learn much. And I've learned a lot already. So. Anybody in the room who hasn't learned something, I'd be some amazed. But it's really exciting, I think, from my perspective, because I feel like if I'd learned more of that, I might still be planning uh, instead of actually working at Google now, uh, telling people what to do. Um, but anyway, this is the last kind of really big, massive campaign I worked on. Um, and I think this is kind of typical of what makes an exciting campaign these days. It's not this sort of three lines on a media plan anymore. It's kind of literally almost every imaginable channel slapped together. It's a nine month campaign over literally Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and I, I, I don't think there was anything we missed. If there was, I apologize to any media owner in the world because we certainly didn't intend to. And this is the kind of complexity that lots of great campaigns have today. This is the sort of complexity that clients want. And I think this is the complexity that agencies want because one, it gets great big fees, but also it is the kind of thing that wins awards. It's a kind of exciting campaign that you really, really can dig your teeth into. But I do think that it may be, and maybe I'm being a little contradictory to Craig, I do think it requires people to be briefed a little bit differently. And as I started thinking about things, I started thinking, well, actually, there's a lot of things that I think should be different. And so what I'm gonna talk about is all the things that a brief shouldn't be for the next sort of five or 10 minutes. Um, and maybe this is controversial, but uh, we'll go through these things step by step. But I, I don't think it should be the work of a planner. I don't think it should be signed off. I don't think there should be single-mindedness. And I'm really sure it shouldn't just be the starting point. Um, probably get, it's getting a lot less controversial from there. So what do I mean by it shouldn't be the work of a planner? 
Um, so I believe the very, very best work comes out of, and I think most people, the most fun I ever had when I was in an advertising agency was pitching. It's that moment where actually, my God, it's 3 in the morning. I'm still here. I'm dead. I'm drained. I've got to be back in three hours and actually presenting in front of a board of some sort of mega corporation. But that was also the very best moments. It's my best piece of advice that I can possibly give to anybody junior in the industry. It's like, wh what's my top five advice? Number one is always go to the planning director and sit down and get involved in any and every pitch you can. It's the time you're going to learn more. It's the crucible that, that makes our industry. It's the really interesting, fun stuff that we all enjoy doing. It's also the, the process that is the most unusual. It is the thing which we all walk out of going, we've made incredible things. How did we do that? I have no idea. Because you get to the end of it and you realize, actually, what you didn't do is work in a room by yourself. You didn't go away and write a brief. I think, truly, it is kind of this collaborative environment. And for me, that's what I mean by a planner shouldn't be the only person on a brief. I do believe it's the planner's job to kind of marshal the forces. It's to own that brief, yes. But don't feel like, and I think David said this and Craig said this, don't feel like you should be writing it by yourself in a room. In fact, if you are, you're almost guaranteed to not be doing it right. You're, you're going to get to a place at the end where actually you then sit down in front of a, a, a creative like Mark Fairbanks, for those of you who know, who will just literally rip you to shreds because you haven't considered everything right. And that's the worst place to be. The worst place to be is sitting there against a creative going actually fighting them instead of collaboratively working together to find a solution to a problem. And for me, that is absolutely something which we espouse, we talk a lot about, we have different tools. And I've, I've seen agencies that have taken on some of those things like Google Docs and actually putting a brief together that is a living document that continues to grow and change because actually it's a public document instead of a private document that the planner owns. And so for me, Really, the very first thing I should absolutely recommend is make it as collaborative and open a process as you possibly can. So um, to all the planning directors in the room, I, so I apologize. Uh, I don't necessarily mean that you should you know, hide your brief away and, and try and you know, be, go rogue on the planning department, uh, you know, fighting off the, the planning director, don't, not letting anybody see it. For me, what I really mean by signing things off is I don't think it is that straightforward of a process. So uh, again, it being Google, I have to talk about Glass. It's a kind of mandatory statement now on every kind of presentation we do externally. Um, and actually, these are some of the prototypes of, of Google Glass. Uh, I have tried the, you know, the most recent one. It's kind of amazing. It's pretty cool. You should give it a go. If you ever want to give me a call, I can try and sort of hook you up. Not all at once. Um, but you know, like it didn't even begin here. It began as a backpack that people had to wear. And you had to literally carry a backpack full of gear to, look, to do Google Glass. And that's where it started. And then it became this sort of, I mean, this is even crazier. Basically, this is a cell phone duct taped to a pair of ski goggles <laughs> and forced to somebody to walk around like that. I mean, it's, it's kind of totally crazy. But the process for me here is what's really important. The process of actually going from duct tape ski goggles to sort of nerd glasses, which was the obvious logical next step, to, I don't know, sort of science glasses down to sort of eventually something sort of cool. Yes, now we're kind of in the coolish. OK, it's still pretty geeky, I admit. But <laughs> it's a massively iterative process. And to me, that's what the brief should be as well. Don't expect that your brief, in fact, I, I would ask, I just want to, I, I try to like my, I like my presentation to be a little bit interactive. How many people have written a brief ever, and that was the final version that they ever did? Anyone? Craig, Craig OK. <laughs> but it doesn't happen very often, I don't think. And I don't believe it should be the goal or the objective of a brief either. Because if you are doing a collaborative process, if you're working with people, that brief should change, and it should morph, and it should grow. And you should expect that to happen. And again, that's why I like things like Google Docs, because it allows you to do that. I mean, whether you're using Google Docs or Microsoft Docs, I don't really care. But the point for me is, Having a system, having a tool set, having a way of making and understanding that your brief, your process, is going to continue to change. Because that's what's really important at the end of the day, is that you understand that this isn't necessarily a linear process. Um, possibly the most controversial thing is I don't think briefs should be single-minded. Because I don't believe great briefs that are single-minded lead to the great work that we require today. That massive complex campaign, I don't think necessarily was going to work if it was just a simple line on a plan. And so we've got this thing called the minimum viable brief, which Ben Malbin has talked a lot about. Anybody know about the minimum viable brief? How about anybody heard of a minimum viable product? 
So this comes from that idea. The minimum viable product is the most basic product that you can possibly produce. It generally comes from the startup world. And the idea is, rather than making and working in silence and working away and locked away to make the most incredible calendar app that you could possibly imagine, and then releasing it to the whole world, and then having no one interact with it because you've missed one or two core product features, and you've burned all your money. The idea is make the most basic calendar, and then listen to what people want. Hear the feedback. Understand the process. Understand what's actually really important to people. And that's how internally we often work with a brief, is it's actually it's an idea. It's a thought. And then it goes back and forth. It moves around. It punches forward, and it goes backwards, and we build on it. And that process of working with creatives in a really, really close way to get that brief to the point where it should be is what we like to think of. And as part of that process, actually what you do is you don't start with that single light bulb moment. We start with lots of light bulbs. And I think that's really a powerful way of doing it. Instead of going in that first conversation with a planner, a creative, and going, here's the idea, exactly what it is, this is what you should be writing your work to. Going in and going, we've got a bunch of different ideas. Which of these is going to make the most sense? Which of these is actually really inspiring to you? Which of these can you write great work to? And then going back and talking to your client and going actually also at the same time, which of these is going to be completely off the table for some reason that I didn't think about? And actually going with a number of these ideas makes that conversation collaborative. It makes that conversation last a long time. And it means that, you know what? Over time, you will whittle this down. You whittle this down to something, an idea, a territory maybe. And to me, that's what I think we should be looking for. It's not that single line proposition, but uh, to David's point, maybe it's because I'm American, but I like the idea of a manifesto. I like a, you know, a giant, big, sort of meaty thing that has legs and arms and can walk and talk and actually has different ways it can move and go. And I want it to have some breadth because I believe in a world that has YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all the different many, many, many things out there, like, that actually you need to have something that is a little bit more complex. Um, Yes, constantly testing involving ideas. Yes, I already talked about that. Um, so my final point is I don't think the brief is the starting point. And I guess what I mean by that is, to me, the brief isn't just the starting point. The brief to me is kind of the, the planner's wild card. And I believe everybody's got a wild card in the process. But to me, the brief should be something that you can flag up at any point in the conversation and go, you know what, actually, we've all agreed this is what we're working towards. This is the kind of thing which we can do. And if it isn't working at any point, you, know, you raise that brief up and go, actually, here's the moment in time where I should say this doesn't make sense. And you know, that process is going to not be linear. I get that, and I, I expect that. But I also think that you've got this point, you've got this kind of card where you can stand up and go, this is something right now that doesn't might work. And that's what the job of a planner as well. And that's what the usefulness of a brief should be as well. But as part of that also, I think that brief should go through the entire process. And the idea that your brief is going to move and change should be part of the process. I, um, well, being YouTube and Google, I thought I'd play a video, a piece of work that we did. And then I can talk a little bit about why the brief was important at this. So let's see if it works. Most of you will have already seen this, but it just, I love it. Now, OK, I, I admit, I, I've played that dozens of times, but it still like, gets me. It's still, I don't, maybe it's the parent in me and the baby crying, but like, there's just something beautiful about that. What's really interesting to me, though, is the process we went through to get to that. The concept of minimal, multiple viable uh, propositions, of, of having a brief that has lots of legs, we ended up getting to the point where we had five different versions of this ad. And we tested it, because we weren't sure which one was going to be right. And to me, that's where I think having an open brief is really important as well. Because we live in a world now that we can actually begin to try lots of different creative ideas. And we've got lots of different ways of trying what's going to work and figuring out what the right solution is. And so what we did before we ran our very first Super Bowl ad, is we tested it in market. And we actually, I think the idea was we tested it out of market. So what we did is we ran it, in, I think, in New Zealand originally. 
to find out which one of these five versions of this ad was going to be most impactful. We had things about potholes, which surprisingly enough didn't win. I don't think. Uh, we had another one uh, about grandparents, uh, which uh, might have been a little bit more emotional, but obviously the one about love and babies was the one that won the day. And to me, that is the great part of this process that we go through. As a business internally, we like to try and figure out what's going to work and what's the most important thing. And in your brief and in your way you work together with creatives, I think you should be trying to figure out all the way through the process what the right solution and what the right answer is. So just to wrap up, um, I think we should be moving from this concept of signed off documents to living documents that continue to grow and breathe. Um, and I truly believe that great creative work comes out of great collaboration. Uh, uh, not, not finally, but almost finally. Um, from a starting point to a constant presence, and oops, I've mixed those around, but also from a single-minded brief to this multifaceted, really powerful opportunity that gives you and makes and hopefully leads to interesting work. And then I'll turn it over to you, Tiago. Hi. So uh, I'll, I'll start by apologizing for a few things. First thing, I'm, I'm very foreign, and I, um, I speak in a weird, mumbled way. So if you don't understand anything, it's fine, because it, 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 you won't miss anything. The, the other thing that I think is, <laughs> this is going to be awkward, mutually awkward for all of us, because obviously I, I'm speaking last, uh, not being or having been a planner my whole life, um, having worked in the, some of the few places these guys have worked, and I'm basically going to replicate every single thing that they've said in the last hour, which is like gently reassuring for me, but really boring for you guys. And I'm not joking, there's some slides in your presentations that actually, I, I've even got the combos thing in my presentation. This is not a joke, I've got a screenshot from it. Right. Um, so, so, you know, so, so this is like the uninformed opinion, you know, think of me of like the monkey to your organ grinder. And I, I mean it, you know. Uh, 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 I mean, I was saying to David before I said, what, what the fuck am I doing here? And he said, well, you know, you're kind of the audience for what we do. And I think that's very gentle, you know, and I think I cannot speak in a generic way, in a way that might be incredibly useful to you guys. So I apologize. I can only speak in a very personal way because, you know, everybody, our business is built in idiosyncrasy. If it's not, you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't have lots of different people just lock yourself in a room and do everything exactly the same way. And I see things the way I see things. So this is quite selfishly, if we ever work together, how I would like you to work with me, and vice versa. Um, before I start an anecdote, um, I think every creative goes to the same sort of emotional relationship with planners. When you start as a, as, a, as a junior creative or something, you go, oh my God, that man went in and gave me a document and I must do what's written in this document exactly how it's written in it, or else I will die. You go to that <laughs> phase. You do it, you don't die, it's fine. You kind of don't do it, you don't die. Go, okay, I didn't die, that was good. And then you go, oh, what the fuck is this? What are those people for? I mean, they're completely useless. I can do all this by myself. You know, I mean, the, the man just wrote a thing that somebody else wrote already, and then I rewrote it. So surely, why don't you just read the thing that the first guy wrote and completely ignore this idiot? And then you realize that the first guy might be an idiot too, or you might be an idiot, or maybe everybody involved is an idiot, or everybody's very clever. You don't know, right? But, but the point is, you can't go, yeah, all right, that for something. And then finally, there's a point where you go, okay, great, actually, this is fundamental. There's a reason why, you know, to, to kind of Craig's put everybody's point, there's a reason things are the way they are. And, you know, I'm all for challenging the status quo and stuff, but it kind of works. Um, having these different people doing these different things. And in the last two weeks, uh, I worked in a very small place, and it's a place that, you know, because it's very small, we pitch a lot. And um, our planning department is, 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 is a bit scattered. One just went and had a child. The other one had some sort of family problem in a way. And I had to do a lot of stuff by myself. And I, I realized how much I miss having them around, not only as people because they're lovely, but because they were doing something fundamental. And having to write this, that, that actually helped kind of focus my mind for this. Right. Now, I really generally do apologize because a lot of this will feel very familiar after the last hour. So I think... This is a process, not a document. We've established that to three other presentations. <laughs> I think more importantly, though, it's part of the creative process. My wife works in television, and she creates TV shows. She doesn't create, she doesn't have a planner. She doesn't have a, you know, she doesn't have creative. She, she sits down, understands a problem, tries to solve it, and formalizes it. Uh, a part of the thing being a process means that you never know who's filling it in which box. Of course, there's a bit where a planner might go and have 
understand the business better and come back with something for somebody like me. There's a bit where I go and sit with an editor or with a developer for a week and make something. Th those are technical, crafty bits that you're doing. But, but I think there's a bit in the middle, the bit that Craig was saying, where it's between the kind of making money and the losing money, basically. You know, I, I'm, I'm on the downwards curve, like way at the bottom. And uh, proudly, uh, 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 out there. But, but um, there's a bit there, which is a bit like what those guys are describing. You don't know where things came from. They just came from one place or another. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Everybody knows that. And I think it's important for you guys to think of yourselves as part of the creative process. Perhaps not articulated that way to some of the creatives you work with, because they might be adverse to people thinking they can do what they do, but you can. Uh, uh, but that's very important for me. I also think that a brief as a document or a briefing as a thing is a means to an end, which is obvious to everybody, especially after the three things you said. But I think <laughs> that for me, the end lies beyond advertising, should always lie beyond advertising. You know, David was talking about kind of briefs in the real world, and I think if I have one beef with what I do, is that we, as a group of people, always look to ourselves uh, to, for inspiration and for recognition, whereas the stuff that we do doesn't live within the world of advertising, it lives in the real world. So what we're competing with is popular culture. We're not competing with advertising. It's fine to win something I can, but it means absolutely nothing if nobody reacts to the thing that you have created. And I think that for me as a creative, this is the most important thing that I need to find on a brief or in a briefing conversation is how am I going to do something from here that's going to exist in the real world and increasingly exist on its own, not depending on anything that you know might support it. I'm not sure what comes after this. Um, We've all established this. I just have a slightly different amusing picture, different from the other guys. But I mean, look, this is, this is the bit where I think I'm going to, to disagree w with Nate. And, and you know, uh, the guy said, you know, it's good to have a document because creators forget stuff. Actually, creators do forget stuff. People forget stuff. Um, I think simplicity is key, you know, and I, th I think I remember somebody saying that to me a long time ago, my first creative directors, good planners make complicated things simple. Bad planners make simple things complicated, you know. And I think it sounds like such an obvious thing to say, such a cliche, but that's incredibly true because although it's good to have the universe that you can, a universe you can draw from to be able to create the things that you're going to do, you also need to know why you're doing it for. Something that's so generic that could be used for anything is not is good for nothing, right? You say that for, from ads. If you, you, you know when you see some ads that could be just kind of express a vague sentiment, but it don't take you anywhere. So I think it's really, really important. This is not about a document, it's about the conversation. It's important that whatever we talk about is simple. If I can't sit somewhere and explain to somebody in one phrase what the hell I'm supposed to be doing, I can't do it, right? I can't. I probably can't do it even if I could, but, but you know, that, that's important. That doesn't mean it needs to be a dead, dry, boring process. Stimulus is really important for people that do my job, and I think that sometimes in the stimulus that you bring, and I don't mean stimulus as in like bits of paper and films and stuff, stimulus as in information. That's where you find the stuff that's going to kind of really take you to a place. And I think that, remember, there's an execution at the end of this. It might be a whole complicated multimedia thing, it might be a press set, it might be a film, it might be, I don't know, there's something at the end of this, and you cannot ignore that there is something at the end of it. And that's the point where this stuff starts becoming really important because although you have to become, I always think about it as something that goes like this. You go to this point and then you go out like this. And by the point you make it go like this, you need to, you need meat for it, you just need the bones. You start with the bones, but you need the meat. So it sounds a little bit contradictory, but make it simple, but bring lots of stuff. You know, Narrow is better than broad. Oh, there's a thing from Australia there, there you go. Um, now, you know, everybody's been talking about Things should be really open, things should be really closed. Every two or three years in agencies, you can't go, oh, you know, this is, this is how we work. And also, we're going to throw everything up in the air and let people kind of find what's interesting in it. Personally, I think that the more you define the space you're playing with, the easier we can make something really, really interesting. You know, this is a quote from Cartier Bosson, who's obviously a brilliant photographer, says, you know, freedom for me is a strict frame, and inside that frame are all the variations possible. That, I think, is really important for a creative person because it, although it might seem like, at first, superficially, saying, oh, you could do anything. I can't, I mean, you could do anything or just have fun on this one are the two most annoying 
things anybody could ever say to me. The third thing is using the word opportunity, because obviously then you know it's a massive fuck up that you're gonna to have to solve in an impossible way, and you're not gonna be able to get anywhere. But this is really important. And once again, look, this is really idiosyncratic and personal, so don't take it as the letter of the law, unless you work with me, then do. But, but it's kind of really important, this, because I find that a lot of the work that these guys talked about had moments of kind of great intellectual expansion, but starts from a point that is really, really small and really, really easy to define for the person that's consuming it, not just for me, not just for you guys, for the person that's seeing it somewhere. You understand what the stuff is about, right? And I think that if you start in a really generic place and you stay in a very generic place and you end in a very generic place, you know, nobody will notice it. Work. Oh, going back now, great. Um, now, a part of that is being really, really focused on the business problem. And it might sound a bit weird to have a creative saying that, but you know, we are solving a problem. Everybody can agree with that. And it is a business problem. If it wasn't a business problem, we'd all be artists living under a bridge and painting with our own blood. We're not, <laughs> right? We, 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 we are solving a business problem. And I always find stuff that doesn't face the business pro problem head on to be, to have a certain sense of lack of reality, a lack of honesty that a real person will, not that you're not real, but you know, a person in the real world will also feel. You know that. You see the work that is, Bill Bernberg had that phrase, irrelevant brilliance. There you go, wow, that's amazing. What is it? What's it for? Oh, fine. And then you go and look. For, so, so, and that, that's an example. I mean, the guys that, that work in my place in New York, I wasn't, uh, I claim no relationship to this work, but the, the brilliant guys that did it. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's, it's a very interesting exercise in trying to kind of pinpoint the problem in the audience. So this was part of the first Obama campaign. They, they wanted to find out a way of actually make the guy win, because that's what you have to do in those situations. And they figured out, obviously, they knew that Florida was a big swing state for the elections. That's where Al Gore controversially lost to George Bush, in the, in, 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 you know, or won, but you know, kind of lost. Uh, and they, they looked at Florida and they realized that the biggest kind of either apathetic or you know, potentially swingable a Republican vote was elderly Jewish people. Lots of them there. And they found out they wouldn't vote for Obama for a whole bunch of different reasons. Most of them, I won't call it prejudice, but you know, preconceptions. So what they did, they created this thing called the Great Schlap, where they invited grandchildren of all these people, so the Jewish grandchildren of America to get in touch with their grandparents who they didn't speak to that regularly, and uh, gave them really simple things, lists of facts you can tell your grandparents, or things you could print and take over, little presentations you could go, so people went and actually took tracks and went to Miami kind of, you know, retirement resorts and presented to like 12 people in a canteen and things like this. And uh, that was a very, very simple thing to do. Uh, Obama won, he won in Florida, and he had the largest percentage of the elderly Jewish vote a Democrat candidate had in Florida in a very long time. And, and that made a massive difference. And once again, if you think about the coming in and coming out thing I was talking about, I think that's quite a brilliant thing. I, 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 I don't think you could ever, I could ever point to you like one particular execution of this that was incredibly well crafted. That's kind of not the point. The point was understanding the problem and solving it in the best possible way. You know, it doesn't mean it needs to be dry. It doesn't need to, it needs to be boring. It just needs to, for me, I think, the more it works, I forgot these things here, the more it works, <coughs> kind of the more interesting it is. And, 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 and you know, we, people are not stupid. You know, the, people see that too. Now, people talk about propositions, having them, not having them. Um, we've all agreed don't have to have them, so this is slightly of a moot point, but I just think propositions, they're incredibly, we still have them sometimes. They're incredibly elegant, a uh, fucking nightmare. <laughs> because you, do, you can't escape from them, right? So I remember working at a place and we had very good planners, lovely, intelligent people, as you all are, and they wrote beautifully crafted propositions. They were always double-headed and always, all you had to do is write to the proposition and the ad, it was literally the proposition. The moment the client bought it, you went, okay, yeah, it's gonna have to be that and that in the ad. If it's not that, we're never gonna be able to kind of sell a different thing because of that point. And it, it, I always thought that the, the problem with that is the thing that, that kind of David was talking about. There were these things that were almost like exercises unto themselves. 
there were closed moments, you know, you got the proposition, you, 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 you built a very elegant strategy, everybody loved it and was really excited by it. But that was the end of it. You know, it didn't have the work that you're going to create as the end point. That's the other thing that I think is quite important. The guys talked about it a little bit. I mean, I find that if there's no tension on something, there's no interest. I mean, obviously, this is like planning 101. You, you all know that, but maybe listening, somebody like me say it kind of slightly reinforces the point. I find it impossible to work on something that has no tension. Absolutely impossible. So if it sounds like, you know, oh, yeah, these guys make really nice chocolate, you go, okay. That's good. really good for them. Uh, or, 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 you know, you know, I've got, so, so, oh, the, the, this bank's great, you know, they give people money, you go, yeah, that's, that's really good. I mean, but, you know, somewhere there, there must be something, you, you, you know, I don't remember who said that, but, you know, I'd much rather, I'd much rather be interesting than be right, always, in the work, because if you could be very, very, very right and very, very, very uninteresting, and nobody will ever find out you're right, because nobody bothers to read it or look at it or listen to it or something. So being interesting is more important. Right? Now, being right is also a nice bonus. You don't be wrong, right? Uh, 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 but, but I think part of the interest, I don't think, I mean, I feel like part of the interest comes from tension. And there is tension on everything. If there isn't tension on something, and by tension I don't mean like hideous conflict, I mean something that you can work against, I think you need to really kind of question the reason for the product or the brand or the thing wanting to talk to people or even existing. Right. And this is very common in what we do. Sometimes you get like, you know, a big multinational corporation with a manufactured product that doesn't have much of a history. And that product's been created to fulfill kind of consumer needs. So they do loads of focus groups. And they go, okay, well, we'll create this biscuit that has three different colors and score this. And you put it there. And by the point they've done it, the, the, the biscuit is like this perfect thing that you can't really talk about very much. But I'm sure you can find a way of making that merit being talked about. The other thing I says, leave space for instinct. The guy said that, that's a wet koala. It's not like CGI. It's not um, fake, or that's what a wet koala looks like. <laughs> I mean, you might tell me, but they're quite prickly and slightly horrible creatures. They're not lovely and cuddly and stuff. It's like bears. Bears kill people, right? You know, they're not like teddies. Anyway, that, that, that for me is another obvious thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're underfed, right, or something, yeah. So, so, so yeah, so, so no, that, 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 that doesn't mean, that's more about behavior than, I mean, this is, once again, not, not, it's not leave space for instinct on the document, like a form saying instinct goes here. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you want to do that, it's great, but, you know, that's not what I would do. I think it's just kind of, it's your instinct and our instinct. You know, you know, sometimes, talking about conversations, when you're talking out loud, you hear yourself say something, okay, that's that. Or you hear somebody reply to something, you say, that's that. You need to let stuff live. I find you need to let stuff live in your head after you made sense of it, and it might make no sense the next day, or it might make more sense, or you know, it might be that it actually makes zero sense, but it works. Oh Christ! I keep going backwards. Okay, I said that. Always consider what worked my result from the process, and everybody said that. I think the end result is a question. That's the thing. The only thing for me as a creator, I think, is fundamental. I'm answering a question. You know. How do you do this? How do we get people to do that? It's a question. If it's not a question, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. This should be the title of the presentation. I don't know it comes in the middle. But there's a few things I think would be quite interesting. If you're going to disagree, disagree in the room. It's the thing that Craig said. You know, come in, let's have a conversation. I'm not British. I've been here for 14 years, so I kind of feel like I can't belong. But people here are exceedingly polite. Right? And we all know that we joke about it. So people go, oh, what do you think of this? Oh, it's very interesting. Meaning, oh, what the fuck am I going to do with this? And you go, and the support does some work. And you go, yeah, I can see how that might work. Meaning, this is never going to work in the entirety of the history of the universe. Right? So disagree in the room. Not a week late, not two weeks late. No, disagree, because the disagreement is probably where the tension is going to come from. That's where the interest is going to come from. Do not be afraid. I'm not saying obviously shout angrily at somebody and throw like a kind of Awarded them because they're heavy, right? You know, just, just disagree politely in the room. <laughs> that sounds really anal, but it's really, really important. Sometimes I don't know what clients are going to evaluate the work by, right? And increasingly, in an era of multimedia, multi channel, multi whatever things, there are things we 
can't evaluate. And I always find it interesting, fascinating, because we create the matrix for ourselves. We go, oh, yes, the, the, kind of, the, the brand awareness in non-owned channels is exceptional for this campaign. Oh, wow. Yeah, great, you know, just sell more. I mean, somebody talked about it. But I think that's really important because you always trip yourself up. You know, we must forget that we don't always get, like, those big, big sexy briefs to talk. We don't always get, like, you know, let's redefine the belief and purpose of this brand for the whole world and change the way people see it. Sometimes you just have to do a job. And it's really interesting. I think it's very important to know what the job is. Do not hide it from creative people. Do not hide it. We're not children. I mean, we kind of are, but we're not children that need to be kind of shielded from stuff. The more we know, the better we work. Adapt to your context, chameleon, David talked about that, you know, you're not always talking to the same person. You know, everybody's really idiosyncratic, like you guys are, they're people that we work better together, but also they're people that respond really well to something very formal, they're people that respond really well to something a bit bigger. It's a bit like when you present to a client, you're not gonna present exactly the same way to every single client you have, so don't do the same thing to creatives. Ah, your combo thing. The thing that always amazed me about this, if you haven't seen this ad, you should watch it, because it's a 30 second ad, it does the thing that American people, and Jerry Graff did the real, actually packs a lot of really functional information about the product, like it's made of cheddar, it's got mini pizzas, it's a new flavor, blah, 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 blah. In like a thing that you would never imagine have that. So never ignore the difficult, annoying stuff. Two reasons, that will trip everybody up later. Don't hide it, never hide it. I'd much rather someone says, look, I've got a brief here, it's a bit of a bitch because this. And usually that, thing that makes it a bitch is that things going to make it interesting. Most of the time, if not just because people that do my job have an innate sense of mischief, and if somebody says, oh, I really don't think that's, we're going to be able to do this, that's what we want, okay, that's exactly what we want to try to do. So if, you know, it's not, it's not, it's kind of basic psychology, isn't it? You just tell somebody they can't do something, they're going to try to do it, so you know, that, that's kind of how we work. And at that point, I think that's really important. Be honest about the opportunity, right? So I have, you know, 19 years I've been doing this. I know I look youthful, but I'm not. Um, the amount of times somebody came to me and said, oh, this is great, this. this is, I mean, it's not the usual stuff that they do, and you're going to really have a chance of changing. And you, you invest yourself in a certain way on the thing. And then you find out it's not that. And also it's like deliberately lying. I think it's being honest about what you're trying to achieve. Because if you look at that Obama thing, if you look at some of the other examples the guys gave, sometimes the value is in making a very small, narrow thing into something that is incredibly efficient, incredibly interesting. And once again, if we know all those problems signing, this is, this is just kind of, you know, just keeping my people safe, basically. Tell us, this is a good bit. This is very important. Create, people think creative people are super precious. You forget that actually we grow up being told no 97% of the time. That's a true statistic. Uh, you know, you do five things. You take your creative director and you're a kid and they go, no. Nah. And then you go do it again. Then you go do it again. And you, go, and you do it yourself as well. I'm sure you do it yourselves. You know, you write it and write it and write it and you do it again and again and again. And rejection is actually our modus operandi. If you ever looked at, if you ever watched Dragon's Den, right? You can tell the people that had one idea in their lives. They're the people that had mental when they're told they need to change a little thing or that's not going to work because that's the only idea they had. And, and their life is ruined because, you know, it's the thing that's going to make them into millionaires and now they're just like idiots, basically. Uh, 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 you know, a bit harsh, but true. Uh, uh, and, you know, live with the fact people do horrible things to my ideas all the time. I do horrible things to my ideas. I will do horrible things to your ideas. You give me something, I go, that's great, and then do the opposite. It's not mischief, it's not because I willfully want to kind of disagree with you, it's just the way stuff works. Don't freak out, <laughs> right? There are dozens of ways of making something great, and that's the thing I think is fundamental. You know, you might arrive at a place, you know, you know David was talking about kind of where you end up with combos. That might not be the place that you thought you're going to end up. I mean, this is all the buzz light here. I actually prefer the one a little kind of bit at the beginning, but uh, uh, they're all great, right? I mean, they're kind of the same, but... Um, it doesn't, it, doesn't more, it doesn't mind if it's not the same thing. I shouldn't mind, you know, I, I sometimes work with directors or developers or something, and I go, I want to do this. They go, great, what about this? <laughs> and sometimes they go, no, you're an idiot. And sometimes they go, wow, that's so much better than the thing, I kind of can't see my thing there, but it's your thing too. And that's, once again, the point of working with other people, not working on your own, by yourself. And if you end up, what you end up with might not answer the question on the brief, but it might solve the problem. 
talk about the conversation again. This is, I remember reading this. I don't know if it's a complete lie, but it's brilliant. Somebody wrote this thing. I mean, there's some sort of kind of paper about how to solve global warming. It's actually if you painted every rooftop in the world white, you might reduce the global temperature by two degrees because obviously most rooftops are black, dark, or, 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 or tarred, and they absorb heat. And white paint obviously reflects it. And I go, actually, that's great. You know, instead of stopping driving and not eating cows and shit anymore, just paint stuff white and continue doing what we're doing. I mean, that's, that's all right. right? I mean, that's not a bad idea. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, people should do You should all do this, 350 people, you know, whatever. That, that, and that's my point, you know. I don't really know what my point is, but, but, but it's, it's kind of, it, 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 should, it should be whatever we do, we do together. It should be part of an honest, decent conversation about stuff. You know, everybody's talking about it not being a document, it being, being, being a thing that doesn't also have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Of course, you start things and we finish them. But we work together throughout the whole middle, not just in that little intersection. And more important, never forget that stuff's going to be made from what you come up with. That is the most important thing. You know, whatever presentation you end up presenting to the board of PNG on a Wednesday night in a godforsaken place is not the end. It's kind of probably the middle. And the, 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 kind of the end is probably a white roof or something. And I, think, I think that's me. So, sorry. Yeah.